Hey everybody, welcome to Lambda School's mini boot camp. It is night two of eight. My name is Deandra Ryan Moss and I'm your instructor and I am teaching you this lesson live from Bisbee, Arizona. So welcome. Let me tell you a little bit about Lambda School in case you're joining us for the first time. So Lambda School is a six month all online computer science and web development immersive. So it's a course where we take beginning developers or programmers who are familiar with other languages or people who have some programming experience but not enough to enter the industry and we ramp you up to the point where you are ready to be hired as a full stack developer. So we cover all sorts of web development uh, topics from front end JavaScript to back end JavaScript, CSS, HTML related frameworks, as well as covering some computer science topics. And over the course of this, it's a combination of live lectures, group work, homework time, Q and A's, all sorts of things that we do to get you ready for that job. One thing that makes Lambda School really unique is our tuition model. So we wanted to make sure that the door was open to anyone who is ready to learn, regardless of their money situation. So we offer something called an income share. That means that instead of paying us up front, you can pay us zero at the beginning and get started with Lambda School. And only after you're hired do you have to pay us back. So how it works is you can do an income share of either your first year or your first two years on the job, which means you pay us a percentage of your income for those first two years. And we do cap that off at 30K. So no matter how much you're making, you'll never pay us more than 30K for the course. But that's a really great option for people who don't want to take the risk up front or can't take that risk up front. So if you're curious about more about Lambda School or admissions questions, reach out in Slack to Karen Zachary. As for this mini boot camp, it's kind of a little taste of what's to come in the main curriculum. So we cover front end uh, web development topics. Uh, today and yesterday were more CSS, HTML oriented, and then for the rest of the course, we'll be learning introductory JavaScript. So a little bit of a taste of what you learn in the main curriculum, but in this course, we're only really scratching the surface of the topics that are covered. So let me go ahead and get us started on the material. As always, uh, make sure you're in Slack if you want to ask questions or make comments during the lecture, Slack is the way to go. And Slack is also just a great resource outside of the lectures because we always have people monitoring that and answering your questions. So, all right, let's go ahead and do this. Tonight we are going to be going over a little more HTML, which we saw some of last night, and diving quite a bit deeper into CSS. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll take a look at that code base that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture last night, and it'll, I think, start to make a little more sense after our dive in last night. So let me go ahead and do that. All right, here is a little code base for you guys. So as a reminder, there are three languages that make up front end JavaScript or front end uh, web development. One is JavaScript, one is HTML, and the other is CSS. We want to see how all three work together, but for tonight we'll be focusing on HTML and CSS. As a little reminder, HTML is the language that makes up what is on the page. So if we look either at our actual HTML code or over here at the page, we can see that there's text, there's a button, there's obviously some sort of container that they're all in. All of that is written using HTML. And we can even see that code explicitly on the page here. CSS, however, styles it. So that's this code over here. That makes it so that, for example, the background is blue or that this header is in a different text or that there's space in between the edges of this box and the edge of the screen. That's all accomplished using CSS. Finally, we have JavaScript. JavaScript helps make our page more dynamic. In a more complex web page or web app, it would be handling all data. So all of the data retrieval, all of the data submission. In this web page, because there's no data involved, it does something very simple, which is that it creates the functionality when I click this button. So notice that the words that were hidden before are now, now appear. Let's refresh the page and do that one more time. There we go. So a simple example of how we can use front end JavaScript is just to change the behavior of, um, 
of some of the elements on the page, whether it's at the click of a button or at a hover over or something like that. So let's talk a little bit more about the HTML and the CSS, since that's what we're focusing on tonight. So as a little HTML review, let's break down what's happening here. As we know, every HTML page sits, has a HTML element and a body element. Of course, we're kind of ignoring those in this course because most of what we're doing is in the sandbox environment of CodePen, where those are taken care of for us. As well, notice there's something called the head up here. This takes care of the label that goes in our tab as well as linking in both the CSS and the JavaScript. Once again, we're not going to talk too much about the head because that's something that is taken care of automatically for us in CodePen. But I did want to mention it so that you guys were aware that it existed. And if you're playing around with writing some code outside of CodePen, it's something you'll need to know about. So what we care about most is everything that's inside of the body here. This actually dictates the content that is going on the page. We can see at the top level that we have a div, which is essentially a container for everything else. Looking over here at the page, we can see that actual box. It's, uh, it has a black border and its background is blue. So it makes it really easy to see that there is a div containing all these items. But keep in mind that without styling, the div might be invisible. Inside of that, we have an H1, which is the most important class of header that says web page. And we can see that we have our opening tag, our closing tag, and any content inside. Below that, we have a paragraph. And the paragraph contains some text, but notice that certain words are encapsulated in these spans. As we can see visibly, we're doing something to the spans to make them invisible. But just in terms of HTML alone, we're just, the spans themselves aren't doing anything from the get go. So we're just highlighting certain words with our span elements. Keep in mind that spans are inline containers. So they're a way of uh, partitioning off different elements or contents, but by default, they're going to be invisible. And whereas divs usually contain large blocks of elements or information, spans tend to be a little smaller, such as just encapsulating certain words. Below our paragraph is a button, which we didn't learn last night, but you can see that pattern of element tag, closing tag, content. So I think that you guys can go based on what you learned last night and kind of understand how this button is working. So if we want to see the HTML alone, we can get rid of our style sheet link. So I'm just going to go ahead and for some reason it doesn't want to comment out. So I'll just go ahead and copy and delete it for right now. So I have just removed the CSS from this page. Notice that we have now all the content on the page. We still have the header. We still have the paragraph. We still have the button. And we even still have the spans and the divs, even though right now they're invisible. We can confirm those by inspecting the element, like you guys did for your homework, and seeing that Yes, there's a div that contains everything. And within the paragraph, we have a couple of these span elements. So we can still confirm them by inspecting the element. But without any styling, the divs and the spans are invisible. So this is a page with just the HTML on it. But if we bring back the CSS, we see that our styling has reappeared. So there's a little review of HTML, some of the elements we learned last night, uh, an element we hadn't seen. Let's take a little look at the CSS. Now for right now, I'm going to be going a little quickly because I just want to give you guys a high level understanding of how CSS works. So don't worry if we're, we're going a little quickly here. We'll break down everything that you see in detail a little later. So let's move on to the CSS page. For starters, we can see that this is clearly a different language. The reason we can tell that it's a different language is, well, first of all, the files have a different extension on them. But second of all, visibly, it just looks quite different. So over here in our HTML file, there's this pattern of these opening tags and these closing tags. We can see that all of our keywords, which are in red, exist within these tags. So that is what HTML code looks like. 
CSS is a little different. We still see some of those familiar HTML tags, but we also see these curly brackets followed by these pairs. These are called um, key and property pairs, or property and value pairs, excuse me. So we have some tags, but we also have some curly brackets. So just on its own, we can see that this is a bit different. For example, we're also using colons and semicolons um, inside of CSS. That is not syntactically used in HTML. So just from the get-go, just from looking at our code, we can see that we're dealing with a different language. And sure enough, the format of CSS is a little different. We always start with something called a selector. In this case, these four elements that are in red are the selectors. This is our way of saying, I want to style this element. So when I type out div in a CSS file, I'm saying I would like to style the divs. In the HTML file, when I type out div, it means I want to create one. Up here in CSS, it instead means I want to select one so that I can style it or select all of them. So here I'm selecting all the divs on page and then I follow it by two curly brackets. So all the styling that goes with the div will go inside of these curly brackets. So here I have four different bits of style that I've put on the div. Something called the margin, which refers to the space outside of the div. So this white space outside of our div is our margin. We have padding, which refers to the white space inside of the div. So everything going around the edge here is the padding. Notice that the space inside is smaller than the space outside. If I change the value, that would change. Now the padding and the margin are the same. So I'll save that and put it back as it was. I also have specified a background color of light blue. We can see that as well in our web page. And finally, I set up a border and I tell it I want it to be only one pixel wide, solid, and black. So if I wanted to change it up, make it a little thicker, or perhaps make it, make it dashed instead, I could change that here. Oops. Refresh the page and we see that the page has updated. So all of my styling for the div elements exists right here in this chunk of the CSS code. Now let's go down to the H1. We can see that we've started another bit of the same pattern where we start with a selector. I select the H1 elements, which in this case, there's only one. But if there were other H1s, all the styling would apply to it. And the only style I put on is I've changed the font family. So I've changed it so that it's now in this kind of cursive font instead of the default font. Down here, I've selected my paragraphs. I've changed the font size. If I wanted to mess with that, I could do that and make these giant, but I don't want to do that, so I'll put it back. And then finally down here, I have selected the spans, which we know are these individual words up here, and I've changed something called visibility to hidden. So these are all examples of properties in CSS. These are all things that we are allowed to change and augment with CSS. And I'll go into more detail on those in just a little bit. But I wanted to get you guys familiar with, um, with how CSS works, which is that we start with a selector, all the style goes inside of these curly brackets, and then we can specify properties that we want to change and the values that we want to set them to. You might have noticed that some styling happens by default. For example, H1s are already set to being larger. If we want to, we can override that in CSS. For example, we could do font size equals 10 pixels. And now we notice that our header is tiny. So it's true that some elements have built-in styles to them, such as the different headers being different sizes, or um, there's also some, some padding that's built or some margin that's built into headers. So there is some style that happens by default, in the production world, often we just overwrite all of that default style so we can start from scratch. But be aware that there is a little bit of styling that is built into HTML elements, such as the H1 size. Um, but beyond that, all the styling happens within our CSS file. It is true that we can also 
build in some styling into the HTML itself. But I'm honestly not going to show you how to do that because the preferred way to do it is to actually keep the styles in their own page or once we jump in CodePen in their own CSS tab. So this isn't the only way to style things. We can also build in CSS properties directly into our HTML, but that's not something we're going to go over in this course. The last thing I just want to briefly mention, uh, be, just because I showed it to you guys, is this JavaScript page. Obviously, we haven't learned JavaScript yet, so this isn't, isn't going to make sense. But on a high level, what we're doing is we're actually using JavaScript to change this value. So visibility can be set to hidden or to visible. And we, when we click the button over here, it actually changes our CSS for us in real time. So that's one of the things that JavaScript is capable of doing. What's on the CSS page will be the starting values for everything on the page, but sometimes something like a button click or hovering our mouse over somewhere will change the value of the CSS. If we actually go to Lambda School's website, we can see an example of that. When I hover over here, notice that the color of this button changes. That is the CSS being updated in real time as we hover over it, and we use JavaScript to do that. So don't worry too much about the JavaScript, but I figured I should mention it since I showed it to you guys. So there is a little crash course introduction to CSS. Uh, we're going to hop into CodePen next, and I'm going to show you a little bit more HTML as well as go into detail on some of the CSS I've just showed you. All right, so let me go ahead and hop into CodePen. Okay. So up here, I've created a little uh, default page for us to start with. Um, I've minimized my divs over here, but notice for starters, we have four divs on screen. And I've already written a little bit of CSS to make those a little more visible. So remember, by default, divs are invisible, but because I've added a border and some margin and padding, we can see them pretty clearly on here. So the first div, it contains, first of all, a header, a paragraph, and then similar to the website that we've just looked at, there's some text where a few of the, a few of the chunks of text in here are actually contained within spans. I haven't put any styling on the spans yet, so as far as we visibly can tell, this is just a paragraph, but behind the scenes, we can see that the text lesson one and lesson two is highlighted in case we want to change that up with our styling later, which we will. So there we have it. That's div number one. Div, the second, third, and fourth div are a little bit boring. They each just have an H3 in them, but we're going to put some more stuff in them. And as you might have gathered, a little preview of what we're seeing tonight. We're going to see how to put an image on our page how to put a link on our page, and how to create a list. All of those things can be accomplished using HTML. So let's take a look at a couple new HTML tags. So for starters, I want to show you the image tag. So there are a couple things that are different about the image tag. You might think, OK, the keyword for the image tag is IMG, so we open our tag and then close it. Well, that's not quite right. Um, there's this pattern we've seen so far, but we're actually going to break it with images. And that's because images are self-closing. Some tags are self-closing, and we can syntactically what we do is we just put a slash at the end like this. So why are image tags self-closing, whereas divs and headers aren't? The reason is that divs can contain content. Um, they're going to contain other things within them. Headers are expected to contain content. Images aren't expected to contain content, at least not in that same way. We need a way to actually put our image on there, but there's nothing that's going to go inside of an image. An image is just an image. So that's why it's self-closing. But of course, we need some way to actually put the image itself on screen. And that's where I'm going to introduce a new idea called an attribute. So some tags have things called attributes built in. Uh, in this case, we're going to use the source attribute, which the keyword for that is SRC. So with attributes, we always put on the attribute name 
an equal sign, and then whatever value we're setting the attribute to. In the case of source, we always set it equal to the location of the image. So that could mean um, the place that exists in our file structure, if we were actually had a code base that existed locally, we might have a hard copy of our image saved and we could just link in the location to the image itself in our files. But for CodePen, we'll use the actual URL. So over here, I have an image. I'll just copy over the URL. You can also click it and do copy image address. So I'll copy the URL of this image. I go over here and I'll paste that in quotes as my source. So there we go. We see now that the image has appeared. So rather than having content inside the image like we're used to seeing with our headers or our divs, uh, we instead use an attribute to put our image in. So the attribute name in this case is source. There are different attributes for different elements and we'll see another example in a minute. So we use our attribute name, then the equal sign, and then the address of the image in quotes. And that can just mean the URL of the image. We then self-close our image tag with a slash, um, have our last bracket, and voila, we have an image that appears on page. So that is how you create an image using HTML. Let's look at anchors next. So links and anchors are the same thing. Uh, the tag name is actually called anchor, or A for short, and it looks like that. So there we go, that's an anchor. And then uh, anchors are not self-closing, so they're expected to contain um, some sort of text that will link. So I'll go ahead and link the Lambda website. So I'll do the text Lambda School. And so we have Lambda School within an anchor, but notice that this isn't really a link right now. For one, we haven't told it where it's supposed to go. For another, if I click on it, then nothing really happens. So once again, as with images, we need an attribute to set up our anchor correctly. So um, the attribute for an image is source. The attribute for an anchor is href. It's really easy to mix up which is which at the beginning. Um, but you'll just, you can look it up online if you forget. It just takes practice. Image is source, anchor is href. And once again, we link it to an address. So in this case, I'll copy over Lambda School, go back here, paste it in, and now we have a link to Lambda School. So it's a little weird within CodePen um, because now our page has just gone away. Um, but what we can do as well if we want to not see if we want to keep our code pen page active is we can do something called the target so the target is another example of an um of an attribute so target equals underscore blank so what this attribute does is it tells our link to pop open the page in a different page so if you've noticed sometimes when you see a link online it completely redirects you. Sometimes it opens the page in a different tab or different window. That's what target blank does. If we leave it off, it defaults to just redirecting. If we have it on, then our link will go ahead and open itself in a different tab. So there are a couple examples of attributes that you can use with an anchor. The href is required. If you don't use href, then your link won't be a link. Target is optional. You only use target if you want to open your link in a different page. So here's a couple examples for you of slightly more advanced HTML elements. We have our image and our anchor. And both of these are a little different because they require this attribute in order to work. So let me close these out and we'll look at the very last one, which is our list. And I'm actually gonna move this to the top so we can see it a little clearer. So lists are also a little more complex because we have to use two different HTML tags to build them. So let me start out with an unordered list. This is something, this is the most common list that you'll see. So in order to create an unordered list, you do the tag OL, that stands for unordered list. So if you do OL, 
you've signified that you want to start a list. So let's say that we are going to list um, fruits. So I can even change my header to fruit list. So now for every list item, we need a list item tag. So on the outside, we have an OL that says we're creating an ordered list. On the inside, we have a list item. And we have a new one of those for each item on our list. Uh-oh, I did OL is ordered list. UL is an ordered list, sorry about that. Well, there's a little preview of what's coming next. So UL is an ordered list, and here's our list item. So let's say we do watermelon. Below that, we could do mango. Below that, I'll do avocado, because avocados are technically fruits, and so forth. So notice that each list item defaults to having a bullet point. This is once again an example of somewhere where the HTML element has some built-in styling. Of course, the bullet points look pretty awful and every single developer's first order of business is to remove them with CSS. But by default, you can tell that you have an unordered list because it appears with bullet points. So now let's look at an ordered list. So for our ordered list, We'll do um, mini boot camp topics. Try to install topics. So mini boot camp topics is going to be an ordered list because I'm going to list them in the order that you're going to learn them. So the first topic, of course, is HTML. The next one is CSS. And the next topic, which we'll start tomorrow, is JavaScript. So there you have it. Notice that by default, um, instead of a bullet point, the ordered list uh, defaults to numbers. So realistically, you'll mostly use ordered or unordered lists, but sometimes you might use an ordered list. And the syntax is really similar on both of them. You need to start with your list element, whether it's unordered or ordered, and then put all the contents inside of it within an LI. Both types of lists use the LI tag. So a little bit more complicated than what you've seen so far because you need two of these elements, whether it's OL and LI or UL and LI, in order to build the list, but not too different, still kind of that same pattern of opening tag, closing tag, and contents within it. And then within these, Opening tag, contents, closing tag. So there you have it. That's how you build a list. So those are all the HTML elements I wanted to introduce you to. As we've seen, there are a lot more. You briefly saw the button in the example I showed you earlier. As I mentioned last night, online, you can find a comprehensive list of all of these HTML elements. You're welcome to play around with some of these other ones if you want. But for now, I think that the ones that I've taught you are a pretty good place to get started. And I wouldn't worry about learning too many of the other ones until you feel really comfortable with um, just regular HTML syntax. So that is enough HTML. Let's go ahead and switch our focus to CSS. So I'm going to kind of squish this up here and pull our CSS into focus. So I've already written a little bit of CSS for you. As mentioned, we start with a selector. In this case, I'm selecting all the divs on screen. And notice that it does select all four of them. And then I style them with a couple different properties. So the three properties I'm using right now are border, margin, and padding. These are three pretty critical properties. And they're part of something called the box model. So when we think about how much space an element takes up, we want to think about the margin. I'm actually going to put them in order to make it even more clear. So we want to think first about the margin, how much space exists outside of the element. Then we want to think about the border, how thick is the border around it. Then the padding, which of course is the space in between the border and the content. So as a reminder, let me tweak these so that you can see really clearly. So when I change the margin, 
the space outside of the element changes. As I make this bigger, that space just gets bigger and bigger. Let's bring it back down to 10. If I start to tweak the border, we can see that border getting thicker and thicker. And when I tweak the padding, we can see the space inside of the elements, but outside of the contents getting larger. So altogether, these make up what's called the box model. And I have a little image here that makes it really clear. So on the outside, we have the margin, then a border, then the padding, and then the content inside of that. And the content, of course, might also have margin, border, padding. So it can uh, compound, but you want to think about all these things when you're just basically thinking about how much space does my HTML element take up. So these are all examples of properties in CSS. And just like tags, these are built in. So we can only use properties that are built into CSS, and we have to spell them precisely the way we we're expected to. So we couldn't just say, um, let me come up with one. We couldn't say background style, because that doesn't exist. There's all these background things that we can do, but background style is not one of them. I had this moment where I was like, oh crap, is background style a thing? It's not. So I could make up my own property, but nothing is gonna happen because we have to use the ones that are built in to CSS. Once again, I'll teach you some of these, but you're not expected to memorize all of them. There are many, many properties in CSS that we can use. And in fact, over here, we can see um, just some examples of all the crazy amounts of properties that we could use in CSS. So you, no one is expected to have these memorized. We just want to get you familiar with a couple of them at the get-go. So we start with a property, and then we follow with a value. And once again, these things are a little more flexible, but they're expected to be of a certain format. So for example, margin is often done in pixels. Um, I couldn't just type out 10 inches because CSS doesn't know what that means. That's not a value it's expecting. It is expecting pixels. And if you want a comprehensive list of everything margin expects, we could go over here, find margin. And we can see that there are a few options here. We can do pixels. We can do um, percentage. We can also, there's a format where we actually explicitly specify, um, I believe it's top, bottom, left, right or we can auto set them all to the same thing. So there are different options for what we put in for our values, but, they but there are only some things that are acceptable and generally you refer to the documentation. I don't have all these things memorized and most people do not. So there's, um, that's a little bit on a key value pair. We see that padding is really similar to margin. It once again expects a pixel value or a percentage, um, Border is a little different. The format of the value for border is actually threefold. Um, so the, so the, here we have three different values that we put in. We put in the width, we put in the style, which could be solid, dashed, um, I think dotted is one, and then we put in the color. But once again, we can't just make something up. So if I did ridged, it has no idea what I'm talking about. Ridged isn't an option, but dashed, is an option, so it works. Same thing with the color. We can put in black, pretty much any of your primary colors are going to work. There are some other things that are built in, like light blue we saw on that example at the beginning. But if we, for example, did navy, oh, navy works. Navy blue does not. So we have to make sure that this matches um, the colors that CSS is expecting from us but we're not limited in the colors we can use. We can actually use something called the hexadecimal color system to pick any color we want. I won't demo that right now because it's a little bit of a side note, but if you guys wanna play with customized colors, I would recommend Googling hexadecimal colors in CSS, and you'll pretty quickly see what I mean by that. Uh, I have someone requesting in Slack that we play with percentage on these, so let me go ahead and change that to 10%. So notice that now the margin has become 10% of our screen, which is pretty dramatic. 
So 2% versus 10 pixels. So percentage is often considered a little bit more sophisticated, right? Because two pixels is gonna be two pixels regardless of screen size. So it still say, it stays two pixels. But if I did 2%, that would actually change. Well, it's not really changing probably because of CodePen, but either way, um, as it were, what actually happens in a production website or web app is a lot more sophisticated. There's a lot of built-in tools, um, generally built into CSS frameworks, or we can customize them that actually will change the style based on screen size. So that is very much outside of the scope of this lesson, but just to be aware, a lot of what goes on with styling in this modern day is trying to make sure that pages look good and consistent regardless of if they're on a giant monitor or on a cell phone because everything needs to be cell phone friendly in this day and age. But there's a little example of how we can use pixels or percentages instead of pixels. So either one works. All right, so I've showed you guys margin, border, and padding, and hopefully I'm starting to get you guys comfortable with this idea of we select something and then we have a property and a value. And we can't be too crazy with what these properties and values contain because CSS expects very specific values for the properties. And while there's a little more flexibility with the values, they still have to be of a certain format or else CSS will not know how to read and interpret your code. So let's look at a couple other properties. Uh, the next thing I wanna show you is height and width. So if I wanna change the height and width of my um, divs, I can do that. So I can explicitly say I want this to be 500 pixels. And now, whereas before it kind of auto-sized to fit the content, now it just became way more giant. So I can tweak this and change the value of that. And if I even try and make it smaller, some crazy stuff starts to happen where the content of the div is actually creeping outside of the div. So this looks pretty bad, right? This has kind of disrupted the flow of the entire page. So you have to be careful with CSS because it's not too difficult to make an extremely ugly page. So let's play with width, very similar. And once again, because I've made the width so small, our page just got really ugly. So we have to be careful with things like height and width. And it's a little bit dangerous to auto set the height and width like this because it's not very flexible for the contents. But those do exist and they are key value pairs that we often use in CSS. So let's look at um, font size next. So font size does exactly what it sounds like it's going to do. And we can also do that in pixels. So if we wanna make everything inside our divs really tiny, like super tiny, <laughs> we can do that. Or we can make them a little bigger and a little more readable. Okay. So that's font size for you. I also, and let me show you, we can select other elements. We've just been pretty much messing with the divs right now, but let's say we wanted to select our H3s. So as we know, H3s have a default font size. Notice that changing the font size in the, div, or in the divs themselves, still, even though it makes these headers smaller, they're still relatively a different size from the text. So some strange stuff can happen without auto formatting. But if instead we directly change the font size um, on the H3s themselves, now that default size changes altogether. So if we want, we can make our headers absolutely tiny or we could make them huge. So we do have the flexibility to overwrite this built-in styling if we want. So there's font size. And the last thing I wanna show you is something called background color. And once again, we have to be a little careful about which colors we choose. But if we just pick something basic like red, we can see it appears. So this is cool because whereas before, 
it wasn't clear exactly how large the H3 element was, now we can see it pretty clearly. So we now know that the H3 element isn't just as big as the text inside of it. It actually extends all the way to the edge. And by doing a background color or a border, it's a really good way for us to become really clear about how large is our element. Because oftentimes our element is larger than, um, than the content itself. But sometimes it isn't. For example, spans, if we did, um, let's do color. Oh, I didn't show you color yet. Color is just changes the text color. So if I do color, uh, let's do blue. On the spans, first of all, we can see that those two elements in spans uh, light up. So over here, as a reminder, we have both lesson one and lesson two inside of a span. So we change the text color with, by doing this. But if we change, or if we add a border instead, it becomes clear that our spans are actually quite small. They just take up as much room as the text inside of them, which makes sense because otherwise this paragraph would look pretty weird with some gaps between those two phrases. So some elements by default go to the end of the screen, which are called block elements. Some are in line, which means they just take up that much space. Um, and those terms actually do relate to uh, some CSS properties, but I don't want to overload you with too many. There are, of course, a ton more than what I've shown you here. You even saw a couple of them on that code base example at the beginning. But for any other properties, I'll leave it up to you to play with them. Once again, don't mess too much with exploring all the properties until you feel like you've really mastered the syntax of these basic ones. But I also invite you to explore the documentation and to learn some properties that I haven't shown here. I do want to briefly address a question that popped up in Slack, which is about responsiveness. So responsiveness was what I mentioned earlier about this idea that a web page should look different, whether it's on a giant monitor or a laptop or an iPad or someone's cell phone. So that is called in CSS responsiveness. A responsive web page is going to look good regardless of what device it's on. And I'm sure you're well familiar with failed responsiveness because we've all had that experience of going to a website on our phone and it being almost unreadable. So we will not cover responsiveness in a mini boot camp. Um, it is possible to make a responsive web page with just CSS, but it becomes a lot easier when we start to put in uh, CSS frameworks like Bootstrap. And I'll talk a little bit at the end of tonight's lecture about what a framework is if you guys aren't super familiar with that term. So that is something that we cover in great detail in the main curriculum because it is a critical skill to have as a web developer in the modern day. But it's not some, besides just mentioning it briefly here, it's not something we cover in the mini boot camp since we only have one day to do CSS. All right, so here we have it, um, some HTML, some CSS. Hopefully you guys are feeling pretty good about doing some basic styling. And as you know, you're welcome to do some Googling and look at the documentation. If you want to find out more details about these properties I've shown you or learn about different properties. The next thing I want to talk to you about is something called IDs and classes. So you might have noticed that the way that we've been using CSS here is a little clunky. When I select a div, I select every single div on the page. When I selected my H3, I styled every single H3 on the page. Uh, same with the spans. But we want our page to be a little more subtle than that. In, um, you know, if we actually want to make things look good, chances are in some cases we would want one div to look different than the other divs. Or we might want, you know, one of our H3s to stand out, or possibly we want some styling that applies to a div and a link and a span, but not all spans. So what I've shown you so far doesn't leave a lot of room for subtlety, and that's because we're only using elements as selectors. As you've seen, when I select div, I select all the divs. When I select H3, I select all the H3s. But fortunately, we have some other options with selectors, and that's where classes and IDs come into play. So, um, so let me go ahead and 
scroll this down and add some classes and IDs up here in the HTML. So classes and IDs look like look kind of familiar because they look a lot like what we did down here with our source and our href. So within our element, we can add some other fun stuff. Okay, so let's say that I, I'm gonna start with an ID. So if I want one element on the page to have unique styling, I can ID it. So I'm going to ID this fruit list H3. And I will give it an ID of fruit. So let's see what happened here. So I used ID as my attribute, the equal sign, and then I put in a tag. So this tag name, this ID name, is something I could I completely made up myself. There's no limitations to what this can be, apart from that it has to be text. So I could just do random characters if I wanted. I could call it something totally unrelated, like trees. Um, but I'm going to call it fruits because we want to use we want to name our IDs and our classes in a meaningful way because that will help ourselves with our coding. It will help our fellow developers. So when we're given the flexibility to come up with a name or a label, we want to try and come up with something clear and useful. So I have ID'd this fruitless tag fruit, which might be a little confusing because it's just the label. So I'll actually call it fruit header because these are our actual fruits. So if I ID this fruit header, I now can style this thing by itself. So let's pull up our CSS again. So we've selected the elements, but we can also select based on a ID. And we use a hashtag to indicate we're going to do an ID. So I do hashtag followed by my ID name, and then I can style this thing in the same way that I styled the elements. So I can add new, um, new attributes to this. I could, for example, do a border around it. Let's do solid black. So notice that my fruit header has been styled, but none of the other H3s have been. So in this way, if I want to just style one unique element on the page, then I can do that using uh, an ID. And we select an ID using a hashtag. Another thing that's cool about IDs is that they'll actually overwrite um, other selectors. So IDs are given the highest priority. So notice that there's already some style on here. There's a red background, but I could change that if I wanted to. So I do background color, and then I could set that to green if I wanted. So this element has a background color property on it coming from two places, coming from this, um, this ID tag and coming from this um, H3 selector. So in both places, the background color have been set to different things. But this one will be prioritized because IDs are given higher priority. If no background color is set up here, then it will go ahead and pull from this one. So just the existence of the selector doesn't negate this stuff. Um, this stuff is still all being applied to it. But if I overwrite any of the properties, like background color, then this background color style will be given priority. So that is an ID for you. It's a way of styling, of selecting and styling a unique element. And as you might guess, IDs have to be unique. So I couldn't put fruit header on different items in my code. Uh, this ID can only exist on one item. Um, I could put a different ID on a different element. I could put this, give this the ID of delicious if I didn't think watermelons and mangoes, or if I didn't think that watermelons and avocados are delicious, maybe I ID mangoes delicious. But of course, I actually do think watermelons and avocados are quite delicious, so we don't wanna do that. But if I wanted to select it, I could do delicious and maybe do color equals orange. So now my mango turns orange. But let's say that I wanted to apply some style to all three of these. So as we know, even though I think that all three are delicious, I can't give them all the same ID. That's where classes come into play. So if I wanted to put a class on, the syntax looks really similar. 
I just change my, um, my attribute to class, and then I can name it whatever I think is appropriate. So I will go ahead and put the delicious class on all three of these. So now all three of these have the delicious class. But notice that they're not appearing orange. Why is that? Well, that's because when we select a class, we use a dot instead of a hashtag. So now that I've selected these with a dot, I can see that the color orange appears on them. So in that way, I can style um, different items on the page. And notice that even though all three of these are list items, classes can go across different, uh, different HTML elements. So if I also thought that this header is delicious, um, <laughs> I could put that on there as well. So there's no need for classes to stay within elements. Um, a, a header, a list item, a span could all have the same class. And that's one of the things that makes classes really powerful. So let's take a look at how prioritization works um, when we're using classes, IDs, and regular tag names. So as we might expect, if I went ahead and selected all the LIs on the screen, and let's say that I wanted to give them a border, So all the list items now have a border. And let's go ahead and give them a margin of 10 pixels. So notice that this, this styling appears on the page, right? Just the existence of the class selector still means I can still style things by selecting the element itself. But what happens if I override this margin down here? Say instead I want a margin of two pixels. So classes are prioritized above tags. So if we select the class, the style that exists inside of the class selector is going to be prioritized above an element selector. So we know that um, these are the, have the least amount of priority, these have the next amount of priority, and then it turns out IDs are the highest priority. And just to illustrate that, I'm going to go ahead and put an ID on this avocado and call it call this ID guacamole. So I've ID'd my avocado. So now if I select the guacamole, and then let's say I want to change the color to green on this. So now my color of avocados changes. So this style overwrites, so this color, because it's part of an ID, overwrites this color because it's part of a class. And this margin overwrites this tag selector because it's from a class as well. So we see that there is kind of a pecking order here. Um, and as you might imagine, this is really the part where uh, CSS can get a little complicated because it's not a trivial thing to figure out what is styled by what. And let me actually try and show you guys an example from the Lambda School website to see how things can get complicated. So I'm going to go ahead and inspect this element. And this is something I'm kind of doing on the fly here, so hopefully it works out. So down here, we can see that it isn't actually, even though it looks like a button, it's actually an anchor, a link. And then if we go down here, we can see here are a bunch of CSS properties on our, um, on our anchor. And I'm sorry if this is a little hard to see on screen. I know it's small, but I can't really make it any bigger. So we can see there are a bunch of CSS styles, but then down here, there are a bunch of CSS styles that are all crossed out. So it turns out that there's all the styling on this one element coming from like 10 different sources. Um, and at the top, it shows us all the ones that end up working for it. There's a background color of this dark red, a text color of white, um, a slight opacity, which means it's slightly see-through. But down here, there are all these other styles that are being overwritten. So the true subtle skill to becoming a CSS master is being able to tell where is my styling coming from. With all these competing styles coming into play, where does it actually come from? And so one other thing I want to show you in that direction is that sometimes, crazily enough, you'll actually have two different selectors. So for example, you might have an ally that says one thing and an ally that says something else. If that ever happens, 
the one that's below will be the default value. So if there's one above and one below, it defaults to the one below if all else is equal. So there are a bunch of things to juggle when considering this, including um, what order the code is written in, whether we're dealing with tags or classes. There can also be a question of, are there multiple classes? So let me show you that really quick. Let's say that this has the class of fruit on it as well. So now we have a class called fruit and a class called delicious. If I wanted to, I could also select with two different class names. And it turns out that even if this is positioned above, if I write color purple, then the color is overwritten here. And that's because we selected with two classes instead of one. So I know that's a lot of stuff that I just threw at you, um, and you will get plenty of opportunity to practice this in the homework tonight, but a little recap of how we, well, let's do a little class ID recap. For starters, how do we add classes and IDs? Well, we use the attribute of ID or class followed by whatever we want to name it. We have a lot of flexibility in what we name our IDs and classes, but we wanna make sure that there's something useful that other developers will understand. And if, as we know, IDs can go on one element, but classes can go on multiple elements. So down here, we use these classes and IDs by selecting them. We can select IDs with a hashtag and classes with a dot. And there's this weird prioritization thing going on. If all else is equal, we know that whichever one is, is at the bottom will be the default which is not happening here for some reason. What did I do? Hmm. Where is that blue color coming from? Oh, I didn't spell delicious right. That's probably part of the problem. Um, anyways, if all else is equal, um, it will default to the class value. And for some reason, CodePen does not want to update right now. Um, but <laughs> that should be orange. Anyways, um, so we can select using um, we can select using IDs, which are the highest priority. We can um, select using uh, we can select using element names, which is the lowest priority. We can select using classes which is the next priority. We can select multiple classes with a combination of classes and IDs. There's a lot of opportunity to select. And it really just takes some practice to figure out what causes what to behave in certain ways. Um, there really is an art to it. So it's going to take some practice, but you will have some opportunity to practice that in the homework tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the floor to questions. I see a few questions already. Um, oh yes, one note about the homework tonight. It will be in CodePen as well. As usual, you will get that from your groups and um, there'll be a couple different things to practice. There's one where you'll actually be reading the code. So in, when, in that one, make sure you don't comment out the code. So there'll be instructions about not commenting the code back in. Make sure you read and listen to those because it won't be very interesting if you bring the code back in before you've answered the questions. And then you'll have an opportunity to practice writing code. So that's a little note on the homework tonight. Let me go ahead and check out some of the questions that are in Slack, and then I will address any other questions that we have. So, okay. So we had, um, we had a question about doing an example of tables. I'm going to actually not do an example of tables because they are a bit complicated and it will take up a little bit of time. So we're not gonna cover tables tonight, but I invite you, if you're ahead on the homework tonight, to play with tables on your own. The next question has to do with the ID taking priority over the element and over the parent. So there's two questions in there. Uh, the first is about taking priority over the element. And as we went over, yes, IDs take priority over the element. When we take the parent into account, things get a little more complicated. 
So notice that um, if I did, let's say, a background color on the div, then let's do blue. Oh, that's horrible. Let's do light blue. <laughs> okay, so I added a light blue background color onto, um, onto the div. So, oh, I see what happened here. Sorry, my bad. When we put multiple classes on, we just want, sorry guys, sidetracked for a minute. I messed up the syntax here. So when we put multiple classes on, instead of writing class out twice, we just separate them with spaces. Now this is behaving the way I expect it to. All right, so sorry, got derailed there for a second. Um, back to this. So if I do the background color on a div, we see that everything inherits this background color. All the child items inside these divs get a background color of blue unless we overwrite it. But inheritance can get kind of weird here. So let's say that I tagged this with an ID first div. And I did, instead of in this main div, I'm going to do hashtag first div. And then I'll do background color of light, oops, of light blue. So what we know based on using an ID selector is first of all, this is only going to apply to this first item up here. Second of all, we know that uh, this would take priority over any background color that's up here. But here's where things can get a little weird. So if instead we select the span inside of it and say background color white, if I can spell white, so this pr was prioritized. So why was this prioritized even though it was an element over this, which was a which was a hashtag, which was an ID? And the reason has to do with that this we selected directly on the element, whereas the light blue background was inherited from a parent. So a selector directly on the element is going to be prioritized over a parent selector, even if that parent selector is an ID. So just another area where HTML can get, or sorry, CSS can get a little confusing and subtle. Once again, this takes some practice. Okay, so, um, so let's move on to, there was a question about class on Memorial Day. Yes, there will be class on Memorial Day, but we're, we definitely understand if you won't be able to attend it live. So I don't, I will be doing a live lecture, but I don't believe that we'll actually be getting together in groups. I'll have to confirm that for you. So there'll be information that comes out on that later this week. But we definitely don't expect you guys to attend live if you can't, there's a lot of flexibility there. But I will be here teaching as usual. So if you wanna join me, you're welcome to. Okay, so Amanda asked a question about, um, hopefully I understand this question correctly, but it's about using classes but doing different styles based on tags. So for example, let me, um, let me set something up so I can show you what I think she means. So let's say that we had a class on this H1. So we'll call this class the very meaningful name of example. And we also had this example class on our span. I'll just do it on this first span. So both this header and this first span have a class called example. So as we know, if I just select example and I do, um, let's do background color um, yellow. Okay, so now the background color becomes yellow on both of these. But what if we just wanted to style headers that had example as a tag? So we can actually select h1 dot example. And now the styling will only apply to any h1s that have the example class. So just like we can combine two classes as selectors, we can also do a tag name and a class. And we can select this and let's say we want to give it a border. Notice that this border only appears on this top element. 
If I just selected the class, it would appear on both, but because I've selected h1.example, it's only going to style h1s with the class example. So just another way that we can make things even more complicated. Okay, we have a question about class on Friday. So we do not do class on Fridays. We do class Monday through Thursday. And if, you're well, if you want to, you can use that time to catch up on homework, but I recommend using the weekend to take a break. Um, so Kyle asked, when we select two classes, does that exclude other elements that just have one of the classes? So yeah, when we select two classes, let's try this example again now that I've fixed my syntax of, so this has delicious and fruit. So if we do delicious and, oops, got fruit. So if I select both of them, notice that only this element, and let me even put it below to clarify that it's, it doesn't have to do with order. So even if I put this below, we see that the blue color appeared on the element that had both classes. And it would appear on any element that had both classes. But the other elements, mango and avocados, that just have the delicious class won't be affected. So, they so you have to meet all the criteria in the selector in order for the styling to apply. Okay, so we have a question about selecting the syntax for selecting an ID and a class together. So we could do, um, this doesn't really tell us too much since, well, we could do delicious guacamole if we wanted, but it doesn't really make sense. And the reason is because, keep in mind that IDs are unique. So once we've selected an ID, we've selected the one element that has the ID. So we can add, you know, we could also do like li hashtag guacamole, but that doesn't give us more information because there's only one guacamole item and it only ha it, it can only have one class on it. So generally, if we're selecting an ID, there's really no reason to do any more complex anything with the tag name or the class name. There might be some example where that makes sense that I can't think of, but as far as I can think of right now, you just, once you have the ID, you're pretty much golden. Okay, so we want to, um, okay, so Pierre has a question about the actual number on the ordered list. So uh, for example, if we see with the bullet points that when we style the item, it's kind of weird because when we put a border around the item, it doesn't include the bullets, but notice that when we change the color, it does include the bullet. So the same is true with the numbers on the ordered list. If we wanna change the color of the number, it's going to be a part of the element. But let's say we wanted to make the number a certain color and the element a totally different color. That would be a bit more complex. The way that it's default set up, they kind of come together as a package. But if you wanted to, you could create a different item, like a span, for example, that just contained the number. And in that way, you could style the number separately. So what you would have to do is remove the default number and then write in your own, perhaps in a span, and style that separately. All right. We, um, so Bridget wants to know how to change the default sign on the LI tag. I'm assuming you mean like how to get rid of the bullet or change what the bullet is equal to. Um, I don't know that offhand, but let's go ahead and Google that. So change bullet style CSS. Generally, I just remove the bullet style because <laughs> the bullets. So um, list style type. Perfect. This is what we want. So we can on the, not the list item, but on the list itself, we can change our numbers or our bullets. So let's go ahead and play with this list style type and change these to a square. So notice that these go on the list themselves, not on the list items. So if I go ahead and select my unordered list, copy that in, we just change those to squares. So. There you have it. And a great example of the fact that 
most developers don't have everything memorized. We have to look stuff up. So don't be afraid to look stuff up as you go. Um, Juan has a question. Any tips on organizing CSS? Because I noticed that it has a potential to get cluttered. Um, my guess is as good as, my, as yours. Um, CSS is always, uh, I'll be a little honest with you and say that CSS is not my favorite part of web development, nor is it most people's favorite part. And it's exactly this. It's really tough to get organized. So, I mean, a good way to go might be to start with all the tag related selectors at the top and then move on to classes. Um, as well, what you often see is that there will actually be multiple CSS files so that not everything is in one place. And a further thing that makes life a lot easier is that generally speaking, when you're actually writing CSS out in the real world, you're using something called a preprocessor, which is, I'm not gonna go into detail what that is, but it essentially is a tool that helps you get organized. Um, you can basically come up with the variable names so that, for example, if you're using the same color in like eight places, instead of having to copy and paste it out, you can just set that equal to a variable name. So, and that actually brings me to another point that I think I saw someone bring up earlier, which is, is this what it looks like? You know, are these the tools that people use when they're actually writing web apps? And I will admit that no, um, on a production web app or website, you're generally not going to be writing in raw CSS. So we love preprocessors, we love frameworks. And I do wanna, I'll take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about what a framework is. So something like Bootstrap or Materialize or Foundation, these are all CSS frameworks. And what that means is that someone has taken, there's all these common things that we do again and again. One of them is this responsiveness idea. Um, so if you wanna make something responsive, what you have to do is you have to manually write out, okay, when the screen gets to this size, change this. When it gets to this size, change this. Or this size, change this other thing. And that is a pain in the butt. So for example, um, something like Bootstrap would have that built in for you. So it's essentially a shortcut. It doesn't give you as much freedom or flexibility to customize your CSS, but it's the shortcut that makes it a lot easier and faster to write CSS code. So as I mentioned, we won't be going over any frameworks in this, boot, in this mini boot camp, but we do cover Bootstrap in our full-time boot camp. And um, in general, frameworks are a very critical part of how developers actually code, because that way every single developer doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, okay, so I see a bunch of questions. Hopefully I didn't skip any. Um, we, yeah, I see that it was Dave who asked, do they build from scratch using CSS, HTML, or use software tools? So kind of the real answer is in the middle of that. There are, you know, there are automatic site generators, you know, something like Wix, for example. So software engineers don't use things like that. Um, we do build things, but that doesn't mean that we build it from scratch. So a framework is something where we're, we are still writing code, um, but we're, using some shortcuts to make it a little easier. So while CSS and HTML are the raw way to do things, generally in the production scenario, you would use something like, um, you would use something like Bootstrap or another CSS framework, unless you had to build something extremely customized, in which case you would use CSS HTML. But understanding how to write raw CSS makes you a much better Bootstrap developer. So we do not recommend jumping straight into Bootstrap without understanding this first. And in the main curriculum, we'll make you do things by hand first so that you really appreciate what's going on when you use something like Bootstrap. Um, we have a question about how to incorporate images from your local map. So let me see, where is that code base? Okay, cool. So let's say that we wanted to, um, put an image in this website that I showed you at the beginning. So I have this image. Can I just drag this thing over here? Will my Mac let me do that? Um, okay, let me copy something from my computer. And 
Ah, it's not letting me paste an image in. Uh, we're going to use our imagination here because <laughs> I don't want to waste your time. I dig through my computer trying to find an image. So let's say that we had something here called image. So this thing isn't actually an image right now. It's just a blank file. So I'm kind of cheating here. But if we wanted to put this in, what we could do is on here create And then instead of URL, we could. So it's saying, okay, just look in the Dream file called this. Because this isn't a real image, I can't demo how it would work. Um, but that's how you would do it. If it were, say, in a folder called resources, you could do resources slash image. And in that way, you can grab any image, whether it's in that source directory or if it's in some other directory, you can use a local image. And that's really what you want to do for something production. You wouldn't want to rely on something, some image you found online, because if they took down their image, then it would break your link. So usually you want to know where all your resources are coming from. So that is that alter way to use um, a local file with the source. OK, well, it looks like the question all has gotten pretty quiet. And I believe we're pretty much out of time anyways. So let's go ahead and call that for now. And then we can, um, and then you guys can get to your homework. So.